All right, good evening. Uh, we are going to kind of do what we did last week. It's unmerited favor. This is part two. Um, so believe it or not, I had enough material left from uh, all the stuff that went into last week's lesson. Ben smiling over there. Uh, I decided to make a whole nother lesson out of it tonight. This, should, this will be it. So this evening, let's uh, study more uh, about the riches of God's grace. As we studied last week, his unmerited favor. Uh, so if, if you didn't get a chance to listen to the lesson from last week, uh, I hope maybe you can go back and listen to it because we covered some things in that lesson and discussed uh, some crucial points about the meaning of the word grace if you're studying in Scripture. Uh, and so we, we talked about how uh, the inherent definitions of the Greek and the Hebrew words that are translated as grace do not mean unmerited favor. Interestingly enough, rather, the sole meaning of the word itself is simply favor. Throughout the Bible, that word grace is translated uh, in, in certain contexts where one found favor in the eyes of another. That could be God. That could be a fellow human being. And this favor was not always unmerited or undeserved. But sometimes it was very much deserved. And they, they received favor because they deserved it. For example, uh, we use Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. It says about Jesus that the grace of God was upon him. The favor of God was upon him. We talked about how Jesus is said to have grace here, uh, and yet Jesus was not unworthy of that favor of God. Uh, in fact, completely the opposite. Uh, this was not unmerited favor. This was simply favor, favor that was deserved, favor that was merited. Other Bible characters like Noah, Moses, Esther, and Mary, other individuals are said to have had grace, found grace in the eyes of God or somebody else. But the text shows, we looked at last week, that they were found favorable, in fact, because they were worthy, not unworthy. So not always is it unmerited favor. Uh, but the basic meaning is just favor. So you, the concept we're looking at is you are found acceptable in the eyes of another. You were found favorable. Uh, sometimes that acceptance was deserved. Sometimes it wasn't. But then we noted the context in which grace is most often clarified to be unmerited. Okay, many New Testament passages talk about grace as it relates to to the topic of salvation from sins, when you look at the surrounding context, it typically emphasizes the fact that mankind was undeserving of it in the context of the forgiveness of sins. So even though uh, the inherent meaning of the word does not mean one was undeserving, when we're talking about salvation, the context that surrounds it talks about how we are undeserving. Uh, Brother Wayne Jackson uh, commented on this Concept. He said, in the New Testament, grace, used 156 times, takes on a special redemptive sense in which God makes available his favor on behalf of sinners who actually do not deserve it. So he makes available his favor to those who do not deserve it. So this is why most people end up defining the word grace, because it's used all these many times to talk about how we don't deserve it. I think that's why we coin it as always unmerited favor. So tonight, where I want to go with this lesson uh, is I want to focus on the sense in Scripture which says we are undeserving of God's favor. I want to look at that side of the coin tonight and how we are truly unworthy in that sense of what God has provided for us and what He's done. So last week we got to talk about that sense in, in which we, a person can be worthy and must be found worthy as they abide in the conditions of God's covenant. Right? Ephesians 4 and verse 1, walking worthy of the calling with which we were called. You have to be worthy once you've accepted God's grace and, and walk in the conditions. But tonight, I'm going to talk about the sense in which Scripture says we are unworthy because we didn't deserve a second chance in the first place. 
We're going to look at that side of the coin, all the senses in which you don't deserve it at all. And there's a lot to talk about tonight. So over the next few minutes, I have uh, three introductory points, I guess you could call them. And then for the second half of this lesson, I have five points. So that's how we're going to break it up for you note takers. Three points, then five points. So first, for our introduction, consider again the simple definition. I want you to think about it of grace. It is God's favor or approval upon a person's soul. God has made a way available that sinners who are not favorable before God because of their wickedness, because of their deeds, that they can be found favorable and accepted in God's sight. Because of this extension of love toward all sinners, this undeserved opportunity, I think is a good way to put it, God does not have to look at a person's soul with judicial wrath for their sin. And he can pardon them. But they can be approved. They can be found right in his sight. Secondly, this opportunity at having divine approval and favor is only found in Jesus Christ. An emphasis on that phrase, in Christ. The Bible uses language that depicts Christ as a realm of safety okay, for sinners. Sometimes uh, what we will do to explain this for people is we'll draw a circle on a sheet of paper. You probably use this illustration with people as you're trying to teach them. And we'll label the inside of the circle as being in Christ. And outside the circle, we'll label out of Christ which really represents all of humanity in one diagram, right? Everybody fits on there. Now we're studying specifically the word grace in Scripture. And I thought it would be beneficial to note that the Bible says God's divine approval, His grace, is only found in Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. God's divine approval and favor. Where can you get it? Only in Jesus Christ in his realm of safety. You're not going to access God's favor anywhere outside of that circle other than in, in, in Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me, but by me. So you know, listen to what Paul said to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul said, Timothy, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is where? In Christ Jesus. Where does one have access to God's divine approval and his grace? Only in Jesus Christ. That's it. That grace that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, let's keep looking at that phrase throughout Scripture. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24 talks about Christians being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is where? In Christ Jesus. It's only found in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. And I love that passage because it helps us to see what happens when one receives that grace and where it's found. Right? It means God has made you accepted in His sight, and that's all, all the only place that it can be found is when you obey the gospel, and is when it's found in Christ. So outside of Christ, the sinner is lost, unacceptable, unaccepted, and uh, he does not find favor outside of Christ. But in Christ, the sinner is granted acceptance in God's sight. That's the only place you can be found approved of God. Only in the Beloved. And I like that phrase. He has made us accepted in the Beloved. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7 talks about that hidden plan of the Gospel. It says that in the ages to come, God might show his exceeding, the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the Bible says God had kindness in mind toward mankind. God had goodwill in His heart for sinners. And the Bible says He loved the world. He loved us. He loved everybody out there. But where did He make it available? In Christ. In His church. 
So first, God's bestowal of this favor and approval, that's the meaning of the word grace. Secondly, that approval can only be found in Christ, where one then must meet the conditions of the grace and walk worthy of the calling with which he was called. But thirdly, I want you to notice that the Bible says this grace has appeared to all men, to everybody. We often quote John 3.16, the world knows it, for God so loved the world, not just a particular group, he loved everybody, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says everyone has access to this grace, this divine approval uh, and favor. If they're interested in having it, you can have it. And that's the message of the gospel. That's why it's good news. It's a good state to be in. And it's offered to all of mankind. For this point, I would like you to consider Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Uh, Paul writes to Titus, he says, For the, the grace of God, the favor that brings salvation, has appeared to all men. Grace has appeared to all. I want you to consider that phrase, uh, has appeared. And I want, you, I want to show you the definition of this Greek phrase right here. This word means in the Greek language uh, to shine upon or to become visible or known. And I'll give you a little visual here. It could be read this way. For the grace of God that brings salvation has shined upon all men. Now that's a good visual for me to understand where it's located and how you know that it's shining and shown to everybody. So the opportunity of having God's divine approval to be found favorable, which is made available only in Jesus Christ, is made known among all the nations. And it shines. It shines like a light reaching every race of people in every corner of the planet. It's shining in the darkness. And sometimes we sing that song, his grace reaches me. Yes, His grace reaches me. You can picture God's grace shining like a light throughout the lost world. You can picture when, when it shined upon you and you were lured in. Oh, what is this? I want to get closer. And you obeyed the gospel. And you got in and you took a part of that. And it was only in Christ. It was made known. Where is it located? Only here. Only in the church. So the sinners outside of Christ are welcomed and they're encouraged by the Bible to come and make their home in Christ so that they can be found acceptable in Him too. Anybody can be found acceptable unto God. Be made accepted in the Beloved. But you have to get into Christ. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. The Bible says if you abide in this realm of safety, in God's favor, that's where it's located, You'll go to heaven when you die. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, the Bible says, Blessed are the dead who die where? Spiritually speaking, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. It would also be an important part of this discussion, uh, which we won't have a whole lot of time to cover tonight, but just to throw out the thought, we use this with a lot of people, but how does one get into this grace? How does one get into Christ? If a sinner is out of Christ and grace is made available by God only in Christ, that's the natural question. How does one move from without to within? To where you have God's realm of safety. The Bible talks about God, first off, requiring faith as a means of entrance into His grace. Right? It's a summary statement of everything you've got to do is wrapped up in that word faith. Faith that follows instruction. Because faith without works is dead, being alone. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2 talks about Jesus Christ through whom, listen to this, through whom we have access by faith into His grace, or this grace, in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So by faith, we access this grace. And that means that when you study that out, we hear God's plan, we trust it, 
and believe it with all of our heart that yes, that's what I've got to do. I've got to get in there. When you have faith, then you'll do what God told you to do to get in there. So it's wrapped up in faith. Trust whatever God says to do. Of course, we always talk about at the end of every lesson the plan of salvation, uh, which in the, we talk about the steps which help us to enter into Christ's realm of safety. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 talks about that last step which puts us into Christ. Right? It says we are baptized into Christ. That's the only way you get that's the springboard into that grace. And really the whole thrust of uh, Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 and 27 is this. Paul says, you know, Christians, you are currently sons of God. Right? So he's writing to a group of people who are in the circle, I guess you'd say. You are currently sons of God because of your faith in Christ Jesus. But how did it happen? As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Makes perfect sense. So it is through faith. You, when you get to heaven, if you get there, it's because you had faith. That's why. But faith that works. Faith that obeys. First Peter chapter 3, and verse 21 tells us baptism saves us. That's the last step to get in. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 says that baptism washes away your sins. That's the only way it's going to happen. So one does not enter. One, you, you, everybody in the religious world talks about grace and how great it is. Listen, you don't have grace without baptism. You don't. One doesn't enter without faith. And really, the whole process of entering in is a process of faith. Following these instructions from the start to the finish, God gave a plan. I'm going to follow it. I'm going to get in there. Well, that's faith. I believe his instructions. I'm trusting in God. And by that faithful attitude, I can access his grace. First Peter chapter 5 in verse 5 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. All right? Not everyone who is outside of Christ will end up benefiting from this grace because they won't humble themselves to come in before God. Many will not listen to God. His plain and simple plan of what you got to do to become a Christian. Look how simple that is. Five steps get you in there. You got to love God with all your heart. And people don't listen. People don't want to enter in. They don't want to do it the way God told them to do it. Now, how about we look again with all of these thoughts in mind. Look again at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace, you... And who is he writing to? Again, people in the circle. For by that grace, you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. All right, so with this in mind, I want you to think about God's realm of safety that's only found in Christ. Paul says here in Ephesians 2, this, this whole opportunity has been made available, and it is not of yourselves. Not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Now I just ask, can you comprehend that statement in light of obedience and faith? Paul's saying, you did not draw up this plan. God did. It's the only way it happened. And when God came up with this procedure of saving souls in Christ, get this, it wasn't because you deserved it. That's the point. It wasn't because you and I labored for it and we earned it as some sort of a payment that God needed to give us so that God said, oh, you know, I, guess, I guess because mankind is so good, I have to send my son to make that way available. Right? Just the opposite. You did not deserve the plan. Right? If you hadn't sinned, Jesus wouldn't have had to come in the first place. It's because you didn't deserve it that Jesus was sent to make a way available for the undeserving mankind. You did not work to receive God's plan. You didn't work. But once you enter in, there's work. Makes sense. It was made available entirely from the depths of God's great goodness and loving kindness toward all of sinful man. And not a one of us deserved, it, uh, deserved even a second chance in the first place. So in fact, we are so unworthy of this plan 
which involved Jesus Christ suffering on a cross. I want to give you five points uh, that can help you to understand how undeserving you really are. So I've titled this section, uh, Tracking Your Own Unworthiness. And we're going to kind of go right in the order here. Tracking your own unworthiness. Let's talk about our unworthiness in relation to God extending this plan of grace. So number one. Number one, you didn't deserve this plan when it was thought up. The Bible teaches that God had the scheme of redemption in the forefront of his mind, even before the words were spoken, let there be light. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. God in his infinite foreknowledge to see the future and his wisdom, he knew exactly how things would unfold. He knew that Eve would be deceived by the serpent. He knew that Adam would be tempted by his wife and he would also eat. And he knew that all mankind would follow in their path of disobeying God's laws thus separating themselves from God's fears. So God knew it was going to happen. It wasn't God's fault that it happened. He gave them free will. They chose that path. He knew they would choose that path. It's hard for our brains to, to fathom this, but before God said, let there be light, if he wanted to, he could have thought about the sins of Travis Toy from the years 1992 to 2020 before he even spoke the word, the world, into existence. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, God said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He knew that King David would sin with Bathsheba. He knew that Noah would get drunk in his tent. He knew that Peter would deny Jesus. He knew that the Apostle Paul, before he became a Christian, would murder other Christians. And on and on down the line, God knew the specific deeds of darkness that every single member of mankind would commit. Every one of them. Every one of us. Separating ourselves from God. So before He even spoke the world into existence through Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Bible says, thought up a plan. The plan came from the mind of the Father to provide atonement for every sin that mankind would ever commit. He provided a way. Thus, making a way available of approaching God so that it was made possible so the man could still live with Him eternally if that would be their desire through their free will. So I'm going to send a, the second member of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, to come live in a human body to make atonement for these sins by a miserable, grueling death on the cross. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible says the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. It was always part of the plan. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 talks about uh, the Father's own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ, or Christ Jesus, when? Before time began. He knew it was going to happen. Uh, Titus chapter 1, and verse 2 in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So the point is, this uh, glorious secret plan was not brought about because of your obedience to God. It was not because you were obedient, but it was brought about because you were disobedient. That's why God drew up this plan. And that's what the Bible is teaching. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast. Do you understand how it works? Right, so if, if there ever was a sinless person to live, other than Jesus Christ, who's a member of the Godhead, if anyone was ever sinless, then God would have to say, Jesus is dying on that cross for all mankind except Travis Toy. Because Travis Toy's performance was perfect, and he never sinned one time. You see, if that were the case, what could I do? I could boast, right? I'd have, some, I'd have something to brag about. If I was the one person other than Jesus Christ to never sin, I'd have something to brag about. Everyone else violated God's laws, but I never violated God's law one time. I'm going to enter heaven of my own accord, right? Therefore, I don't need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
Paul's point here is there's nobody that can boast like that. Nobody. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat in the need of a Savior. Therefore, salvation is God's gift. Even though there, are, there is work required on our part, it is God's gift, not God's payment that he owed anybody. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, the Bible talks about when the kindness and the love of our God, of God our Savior, toward man appeared, not of works of righteousness which we have done. That's not why he did it. But according to his mercy, he saved us. So you didn't deserve a way to heaven, but God provided the plan anyway. So number one, you didn't deserve the plan when it was thought up. Number two, you didn't deserve the plan. Keep going down the line. When Jesus died to fulfill it. Isaiah 53 and verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. all right, Jesus didn't deserve to go through what he went through. If anyone was undeserving, it was Jesus Christ. He didn't deserve the punishment and that pain and all the agony that he went through. And we were certainly unworthy uh, for God to draw this up and for Jesus to actually go through and fulfill it. We didn't deserve it for a second. Picture Jesus up on the cross when you sin. You're part of the reason why he's up there and why God put him up there. So we're certainly not... We are certainly unworthy of the perfect lamb dying to make salvation available to us. Number three, you didn't deserve the plan even when you heard and obeyed the gospel. Do you remember when you first obeyed the gospel? Having come to the realization of the truth finally and coming up out of the waters of baptism, you made that commitment to Jesus. Do you remember the feeling that you got when you understood I don't have any sin on my record anymore. And you could think back to all the times that you acted wickedly and violated God's holy laws. And you thought to yourself, those sins are gone. God is not holding me guilty for these actions anymore that I previously committed. And it's as if I never sinned in the first place. So you see, when you obeyed the gospel, you didn't deserve to have those sins remitted. All right, nothing you did caused you to deserve that gift for your sins to be blotted out. And that's probably why it's such a great feeling when you understand these truths. All right, those sins will never be remembered again. So you didn't deserve it when you obeyed the gospel and God's plan of salvation. Number four, now that you are in Christ... You've obeyed the gospel. Today, all of us in this room who are in Christ do not deserve God's plan when we receive continual cleansing as a faithful Christian. You know, we've got to understand what a good deal we have being in Christ. At baptism, you gained access to the blood of Christ, washed away all your previous sins. But now, as a Christian, when you slip up and you sin, after the waters of baptism, you have continual cleansing from Jesus Christ and His blood as long as you are remaining faithful to Him. Not using God's grace as a license to sin. That will disqualify you. So as long as you are living that lifestyle and having faith, living by faith, you have access to the blood of Jesus Christ. First John chapter 2, and verse 1, John says to Christians, My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. Right? I, I don't want you to sin. You're not supposed to sin. Try your hardest not to sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation or atonement for our sins. And listen to this part. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. If they want it, they can have it too. 1 John 1 and verse 9 says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's when you're a Christian and you sin. Verse 7, of course, says, As long as we are walking in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing you from all unrighteousness. 
Do you realize how lucky we are as Christians to have direct access to the blood of Jesus Christ on a regular basis? You know, ask the ancient Jews from the Old Testament how glad they would have been to access forgiveness without having to perform a sacrifice every time they violated God's law. How efficient is this system of justification? All right, we've got it good under the new covenant. When you compare it to the old covenant, and even as difficult as it is at times to abide in the conditions of this covenant, right? it is difficult. We really don't deserve to be forgiven over and over and over and over and over again. All right, do you realize what a blessing it is by simply being faithful? Not perfect, just to be faithful. Think about how many times we stumble into sin throughout the week. Even though we are trying our very hardest, it always seems like we can lay our head down at night and think about at least something that we need to ask God forgiveness for for that day. It always seems like there's something that you can think of that you did wrong. And God keeps cleansing us as we live by faith over and over and over again. We sing that song as well. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. It gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. So we have to understand, you know, you did not, you did not even deserve to be cleansed the first time, let alone time and time again throughout the Christian walk. So you didn't earn this privilege. That's what the Bible is saying. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it for God to even make that available. But what a rich blessing he's given us access to if you'll walk by faith. But now let's remember and just note this side of the coin that there are many of those who take this truth way too far the other direction. And as kind of we talked about this morning, they'll say, well, because the Bible talks about how we don't deserve grace, that means it doesn't matter how we live in regards to righteousness. It doesn't matter your lifestyle. Well, where in the Bible do you get that idea from? Where does it come from? No, you have to live faithfully to the covenant as a condition of God's grace. Remember the illustration that we used last week. You disqualified yourself from the race because of your sin. On your own, you missed out on the prize, right? You blew it. But God gave you an opportunity to be reinstated. And he gave you conditions by which you must run the race. And he said, if reinstated, you must run the race according to the rules. That's still by grace. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul says, And also, if anyone runs or competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And that's us in the Christian life. In the same way, we must run according to the rules, walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. But in the sense that we've been talking about, remember, you didn't deserve a second chance in the first place. You don't deserve to be running again. So number one, uh, you didn't receive God's glorious plan when it was thought up in eternity. Number two, you didn't deserve it when Jesus died to fulfill it. You didn't deserve it when you heard it in the first place and obeyed it. You didn't deserve it when you live faithfully every day as a Christian. Now number five, we'll close with this point. You won't deserve it when you enter into heaven. I want you to imagine when we finally all together walk through the gates of that city. Each one of us will walk in with that understanding that this is a complete privilege entirely. I really do not deserve to be here, but God, by his grace, has allowed me access to entering in. Remember, the Bible says salvation is not of our own doing, but the emphasis is it is the gift of God. Not, uh, not a one of us deserves it in this sense. Not a one of us was good enough by our own works alone. But if we just work hard and we trust God's way until the end, we can be found worthy. So remember these two senses in which Scripture talks about in which we are both worthy and unworthy before God at the same time. Unworthy because we did nothing to deserve this avenue of safety. Worthy because we did what we were told to do. 
as we trusted God's way. So in this sense, you are both worthy and unworthy at the same time. Because Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14 says to the faithful, all those in Christ, it says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So if you take God's path to safety and you follow it with all your heart and with all your soul, the Bible says you have the right to the tree of life. That is because you ran well. Because you lived faithfully, the tree of life will be yours. And that's why Paul, as he chased the prize, said statements like this. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. But I discipline my body, and I bring my body into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway or disqualified. You think the apostle Paul could have been disqualified? So like Paul, let us run well. Let us seek our very hardest to please God, to be faithful, knowing that the wonderful grace of God gave us a second chance, gave us some conditions that we could actually perform and do, and he provided us a way. So let us run with endurance the race that is set before us and keep going, keep pushing. Uh, And by God's grace, it's possible. It's doable. He hasn't given us a a path that's uh, impossible to do. It's not asking for flawlessness, but faithfulness. We'll offer up the invitation. Anybody listening on Facebook or Zoom need to become a Christian in order to go to heaven. Uh, You have to hear the gospel about Jesus Christ. Believe it. Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your sin. Repent. Confess. Confess his name before men. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, washing away those sins. Come up to walk in newness of life, to remain faithful unto death as the condition of the covenant, uh, and you will receive the crown. So if anyone would like to do that tonight, or if any Christians need repentance, uh, please come while we stand and sing. Please turn to number 36.